when you first started filming State of Electronics, there did seem to be a perception that for young people sort of choosing a career, that electronics wouldn't be the first thing that came to mind. From my view, Australia is still battling a lot with the decline of sort of traditional manufacturing industries and the so-called transition to a service economy and the idea that people will do high level jobs. It seems to be, countries seem to specialise in an area and then competition arises and then another country takes over. So moving things along between countries, that seems to be how it goes. You can only shift labour costs to another country for so long before that stops being effective. Over the course of a number of years, we saw a decline in interest in the education sector and in practical electronics and you know, manufacturing in general. There was this concept that Australia is no longer a manufacturing company, it's not so relevant, so why teach it? Yeah, I do have a foot in the door in an industry that's closing down in its manufacturing department. It, it's a pity. I probably can't talk too much about that one. I believe that people need to have a bit of an understanding what electronics is and how it works to get rid of the fear of it, the unknown. So a lot of people now having electronics implanted into their body might be scared because most people understand electricity is bad, it can kill you. So I do believe that they need to understand a bit about it. I guess in a broader sense society doesn't understand a lot of things and you don't necessarily have to understand everything in order to derive benefits from it or to sort of live in it. But I agree that it would be useful if more people understood some more about electronics. We're now relying on electronics for everything in our day-to-day -day life from vehicles, phones, life support, anything. One thing that's affected the role of electronics in society is it's less visible than it was. Even though it's more pervasive, it's less visible. Electronics is the single most important invention that the human race has ever come up with. So the importance of electronic innovation in our society, I think, is important in the sense that so many other things cross over with electronics. And quite often technology in the broader kind of discourse and people's understanding focuses on things like apps and services and kind of high level kind of things. But a lot of those things these days are more and more integrated with devices, either phones or sensors or some other kind of gadget. At some level, that intersects with the electronics because if you don't understand all the way down to the actual device that physically exists somewhere, then you can't effectively kind of bring that out the full possibility of what's there. Five years ago, it appeared to me that electronics was at a, a very critical and very dangerous point. Things do change. The, the introduction of globalisation for not the first time by any stretch of the imagination in global history makes these sort of approaches just happen. We adapt, we move, we change the way we do things. We increasingly move towards more automated manufacturing rather than manual driven manufacturing. Yeah, look, the, the robots are coming now. The, where we're at with artificial intelligence is narrow AI is just in everything already and we're just around the corner of a full AI that can start doing most of what humans can do and that's just going to change things forever. It certainly is a consternation, the, the, the worry about uh, robotics and um, automation taking over jobs. From my standpoint, I work in factory automation, but this sort of thing's been happening for multiple decades, maybe five or six now. It's not a sudden thing, and there's been some benefits along the way. I don't think it's going to move as fast as everyone thinks. But I think there'll be opportunities which arise out of that whole, that whole change. I think we will see it come back to Australia as light manufacturing or artisanal sort of manufacturing, and the world will move on. We'll get back to new jobs, new places, new things. But it's going to be rough. Totally exciting too. Yeah, who, who knows what jobs are going to be left if machines can do all basic tasks that humans can do. I think five or ten years ago there was a decline in electronics. I took the movement of Dick Smith Electronics out of electronics personally. One of the public perceptions of electronics and possibly amateur radio also is that it was old hat. There were other things replacing with it. What hobby electronics is is evolving. Yeah, as there's, there's a bit of shift more towards programming and computers and coding and they're being more accessible, there has been a little bit of moving away perhaps from electronics and transistors and, and soldering. Automation is generally the solution to expensive labour labor costs. Just because we're going to be a service economy doesn't mean that nobody will ever physically do anything with their hands ever again. One thing that we saw a number of years ago was a lot of the technical schools closing or restructuring and becoming universities in a more traditional sense. Possibly the decline of TAFE has had a effect so it's more on the theoretical at university level and maybe less on the practical side. I guess in the past we did have that bit more separation between technical skills and academic skills. I think there is a class aspect to that certainly that people felt like they didn't want to do 
what they perceived as low level or manual jobs. And so they lost a lot of that hands-on technical quality. Also, it's expensive to repair things relative to what they cost, so maybe there's been a decline there. It's more the throwaway that we don't fix stuff anymore that I think is the real erosion of, 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 of a skill base. I mean, once upon a time there was a radio or a TV repair shop on, you know, not every corner, but on enough of them. Something that actually gives me a little bit of hope is the time that I've spent in China and also in Indonesia where due to essentially a closer gap between the wages that people are paid and the prices of electronics, things do get repaired more and you see people stripping down old devices for parts, taking things out, keeping things living for a long time. So around about 2009, uh, hacker spaces started uh, popping up around the world, uh, off, I think in part due to a, a Wired magazine article that talked a lot about the uh, hackers on a plane where Mitch Altman and a number of other people went to uh, Europe to uh, find out what been going on there with the Chaos Computer Club, came back and started Noisebridge and NYC Resistor, and then other people around the world in Australia we started Hackerspace almost simultaneously. So Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney Hackerspaces all started around early 2009. There was the start of a resurgence in the interest in electronics, but I could still see potentially that it would disappear. It's a, it's a time of change and one needs to adjust a little bit with the change. Some things are going to perhaps decline, but we're also going to think of where the opportunities might be. So what we saw was removal of a lot of opportunities to explore the hands-on education through things like tech schools. People who are curious and who want to push their boundaries and want to go to the next, or do things that, aren't, that don't exist, make products or ideas that they, they can't buy off the shelf. You need to know that stuff. But there has been a bit of a change, at least in amateur radio, in that we've made it easier to become a radio amateur. I think Hackerspaces uh, came from the notion that not only was it desirable to, to make these uh, workshops where everyone could share knowledge, but it was also actually not too hard to do. You sent an email and said, let's, let's make stuff. I think there's a change in the hobbyist movement and what they have access to, as opposed to that it perhaps has been adversely affected by the way that electronics has changed. I certainly believe that a lot of people have now re-sparked their excitement for electronics. There's a like a revolution taking place, yeah. You can see it um, growing across a, a lot of different um, areas. It's just a simple idea to uh, send out a mail, invite a few friends to say, hey, let's get together and, and, and hack and we'll make, we'll make some projects each weekend. And it's been quite humbling and to see how much uh, everyone's contributed to that idea and so the hackerspace now it's, it has its own space it's, it's a committee there's an un, uncountable number of people have come through and uh, particularly kids have learned a little bit about uh, electronics and software and uh, yeah it's, it's hard not to have a sense of satisfaction to uh, play just a part in that. Five years ago Arduino itself was the novelty and so people were just becoming aware of it. But in the time since, what's happened is that awareness of things like Arduino and open source hardware has grown tremendously. People are making everything from little creations line following robots and things like that, getting really engaged in the technology, making kits with uh, Arduinos and shields. We're back making circuit boards again, but we're putting different technology down there to, uh, to make new and interesting things. So what's happened is that people have moved their thinking along. They're no longer thinking, oh, Arduino, I want to play with an Arduino. They're starting to think, I have a project or I have an idea that I want to create. And so Arduino is the building block or the stepping stone that lets them get there. I think we've always made things in sheds and backyards in Australia. And I think Tim O'Reilly and his publishing empire gave that a name and a brand and came up with Make Magazine and the Make Affair. That no notion of creating creating spaces where you can play with electronics and, th and uh, 3D printers and, and Raspberry Pis, build robots, play with quadcopters is, is one that uh, has, has resonated with a lot of people. I think drones and Raspberry Pis and uh, Beagle Bones and, uh, and Arduinos are all really engaging people and uh, making whatever they think they'd like to get done very possible to do. Uh, one of the things from being involved in makerspaces and hackerspaces is often seeing uh, electrical engineering graduates or people who supposedly have had this very high level theoretical understanding of electronics but they might have touched a soldering iron once in the course of their degree. In terms of actually hands-on knowledge they have very little and they end up learning that on the job afterwards. At University of South Australia they saw that a lot of their engineering students had never picked up a soldering iron, didn't know one electronic part from another and yet they were going into a course that required them to learn about programming and how computers work without a fundamental knowledge of what's going on under the hood. So the very interesting approach they took was to buy a big stock of experimenters kits for Arduino which included an Arduino compatible board, various parts and a project guide and they simply distributed 
one to every student coming into the computer science course with no particular agenda. There was no outcome in terms of assessment, but what they were doing was asking students to go away and just use it as a learning experience and see what they could come up with. And then at the end of the semester, they would have a bit of a show and tell and demonstrate different projects they'd built, but there was no grading on it. And I think that's interesting because it's a bit of a return to the technical hands-on roots. As a hobbyist, I'm involved with one of the hacker space groups, so we build electronic projects. A lot of them are, are Arduino now, which is a really good standard for doing projects in electronics. I think the big contribution of Arduino is it has popularised programmable electronics and to some extent electronics itself. Man, I wish that existed when I was a kid because that just takes it to a whole new level. I would, I, I think I would have been so hooked you wouldn't have been able to pull me out of it with anything. By itself, an Arduino is pretty useless. You need to interface it with the outside world and that means that you do need some sort of interface boards. If you want to customise to do what you want to do, then there also needs to be involvement from you in electronics. That's where a lot of the custom made things, things that you might want to design, can really come into their own. Drones are just so uh, big at the moment, they're taking off so much because the technology is advancing really rapidly and people are just realising they can do more and more with them. It's RC with its own brain. That's, that's what it is, that they can fly themselves. You don't have to have a pilot skill and you can just program them to do tasks. That's really where it's at at the moment. I feel like there's something of a rise of electronics at the moment. Since, since then, with the rise of the, the, ma the maker movement and uh, uh, the availability of hacker spaces around the world, easy entry points such as the Arduino, the Raspberry Pi, uh, 3D printers, and uh, also a Kickstarter, uh, a lot of, a lot of um, hardware projects there, it makes it sound like there's actually a sense of greater interest and, and career possibilities that didn't exist before. I don't see there as being a decline in electronics at the moment. You certainly couldn't say that today. What we've seen is a resurgence of the hobby electronics industry in a very different way, with much more online retail. With the change over time, I do see a maker revolution occurring, and one of the main reasons for that is the internet. I don't recall getting access to information and, and components and knowledge and tools being incredibly difficult. I mean, that was part of the challenge and part of the adventure. Today, of course, you've got the internet and you can get access to a great deal of information, but a lot of it isn't very high quality. Components today, in real terms, are a lot cheaper than they were in the past, and information is also a lot easier to get. One other thing though is that information may not be as organised. The internet can be overwhelming with the number of choices and there's nothing like getting involved in a club where you can actually get some, um, some experience from other people who can guide you down a path. I think with the maker movement it's brought a lot of people into electronics that previously didn't consider themselves electronic nerds. I think part of that is with the rise of programmable electronics. When I think of making, and in particular perhaps coming from a technical background, I think of something that is technical in some way. What, what making means to me is making that connection between an idea that just exists as a pattern of neurons in your mind and then physically instantiating that, you know, making it corporeal, making it actually exist. And I think that's a very basic human instinct. I guess when I sort of think about, say, woodworking or when I think about something that might be metalwork or those sort of things, I sort of, you know, maybe think twice whether I associate it with being a maker because for me, you know, I'm very much into the electronics, the hardware, the, the, the software sort of, sort of things. But I think it is a bit of a, a, a personal thing. Uh, in that for me, I think making sort of revolves around having some sort of science, technology, engineering, mathematics aspect to it. But I think that's once again because of where I come from and my background. Making these days is very broad, from traditional sort of handicrafts. I don't think that, you know, is cooking making? I don't know. I'm not sure that just sending a file to a 3D printer is making. I think there's got to be that uh, connection between the mind and the hands. And so I think it's absolutely essential that that maker, that hobbyist, that, that interest in technology is nurtured. I'm not too surprised that so many people in electronics these days come from a hobbyist background. The really important thing about the maker movement is it's tried to remove that gender distinction between what's men's work and what's men, women's work. What we're seeing now is those opportunities are being reintroduced into schools that would not traditionally have taught those sorts of subjects. For example, um, Lauriston Girls School here in Melbourne has been very active in creating a maker space. They have 3D printers and all of the tools that you would want in your ideal home workshop. And they're making these available to students. Yes, I think it's part of the stream of woodworking, metalworking, and all of the technical type of sections in the school that, that give particularly kids who don't have that exposure anywhere else 
at least a taste. There's a lot of um, gaps in between what the schools do, what industry needs and what the makerspaces can do and really what I hope is that um, in the coming years that will get some, you know, everything kind of gels. The parts of the various um, organisations and just see if we can uh, do things more effectively. The education system certainly needs more curriculum in that area. We see a lot of teachers down here and there's, there's plenty of opportunity, plenty of way to go with that. With education in high schools and technology, I think it's important that it's part of the curriculum these days. Although people say that, the, you know, every kid needs to learn how to code, that code runs on hardware. The epicentre of it all is hardware, it's electronic. So for me, it's, it's, you know, it's very much on the rise and we can see that in wearables, we can see that in the democratisation of hardware, in, you know, in 3D printing, in being able to democratise things, being able to have personalised manufacturing. I think all of that is boding really well for electronics. I think in Australia, and in like a lot of the Western world, making things is important and it's good to see something of a resurgence and something of an interest in, even outside of electronics, in kind of handmade things. Making serves two needs. There is a practical need to make things, but there's also a human instinct to be creative. The electronics can be the same way. It's not just a cold engineering problem, it's a way of being creative and expressing yourself. One of the things I suppose with industrial society and then we've seen industrialisation move to China and even cheaper manufacturing is all our things are so cheap. However, there is still a yearning to create. And with things like the 3D printing, Arduinos, that sort of yearning is now able to be satisfied by ordinary people. And I think that's really important. The ability to view electronics as an art is something that gets forgotten a lot. There are not that many people anywhere in the world at the moment that are really approaching it with that kind of view. I think in Australia that, that that culture of making things, of building things, you know, there's this concept of tyranny of distance, that we're a long way from anywhere. You really have to use your own resources. The isolation of Australia is, I think, what drives our need to innovate and be self-sufficient and to improvise. With the hackerspace groups that I'm involved with, I'm seeing a lot of young people being involved with it. Teenagers have an interest in things within their world, and electronics and that is part of them. But the whole movement has also grown as well, and there's more than one hackerspace around Melbourne now, and yeah, it's good to see that uh, the whole the whole you know the whole thing is growing as a whole i almost fell into doing the kind of work that I do where I do freelance electronics bits and pieces by accident because of being so involved in hobby activities which are also going through a resurgence and seeing all of this interest in the hobby and enthusiast space that was spilling over and being mirrored in the technology space, more and more startups, more and more small companies. People who traditionally maybe weren't thinking about electronics are starting to say, well, let's make a gadget, let's make a device. We very much do need an ecosystem right from hobbyist maker into industry. We need to enable people in such a way that there is this underlying skill set that might not necessarily be what you assume essential to your everyday yet enables you to do your everyday in a way that's effective and efficient. Being able to have perhaps interacted in some STEM or, or hobbyist or maker type education in school and just knowing some of the things around 3D printing and what you might do might enable you to at a later date in your, in your workplace perhaps come up with a more creative solution because you're open to different ways of thinking or, or, or utilising resources. It, it is very important for electronics to be taught within the context of other STEAM subjects. In fact, the real poster child for open source hardware, Arduino, grew out of an arts course. I think we need to know more about technology, but the key thing moving forward is probably to learn how to apply it, and that's the kind of the missing link. You know, there's a lot of information out there, and, and uh, but learning how to apply it and where it's valuable and what it means and what it does, how it's going to lead to job growth is really the key thing. Electronics can be an asset to almost any field, so it, you, it doesn't matter what you are working on, electronics is probably going to factor into it in some way to enable you to achieve the end result. Yeah, applying it means you've got to understand it and you've got to have a try at applying it and, and you've actually got to make failures. You've, you've got to you know, have a couple of failures and, um, you know, before you can move forward and uh, apply it successfully.